episode number 13. Hello and a very, very warm welcome back to the Gita Decoded. Today we are looking at the second part of the Yoga of Action, that which is contained in Chapter 3 of the Bhagavad Gita. So far, Sister Denise has explained to us what the various concepts that are explained in the first part of Chapter 3 means, and now we are going to go into it a little bit deeper. Sister Denise, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Great to have you here. Uh, tell me, um, sacrifice and action. Um, I'm of the view that this is highly misunderstood because uh, people um, sacrifice everything from food to um, uh, relationships to action to um, unmentionable things. Uh, in the name of God and experience sorrow as a result of their sacrifice. Um, I need to understand um, the purpose of sacrifice is not for one to experience pain, is it? Well, let's look at the meaning of sacrifice. Usually people think it means give up the thing that is most dear to you, as in, you know, Abraham's sacrifice of his son. But sacrifice, if you look at it uh, from another angle, it means to make something sacred. So sacrifice actually means that instead of taking it as yours, um, you put it uh, in front of God, you place it in front of God, you give it to God, and then you do with that thing according to God's direction rather than according to your own ideas. That is really the idea of sacrifice. But um, it's been taken in many different ways by people and I think that if somebody experiences sorrow as a result of making a sacrifice, it means that they were attached and they didn't give it up or it means that they didn't understand what sacrifice is, or it means they did it under duress or something like this. So um, I think when something is a real sacrifice uh, done in the right spirit, then it will carry a person forward. And if it takes a person backward, it means you know that they didn't do it quite right or it, they weren't up for it or they didn't understand what that is. Mr. Denise, what is meant by verse 10, having created mankind along with sacrifice, Prajapati, the Lord of creatures, anciently said, by this, uh, in other words, the sacrifice, may you bring forth, may this be your wish fulfilling cow. I read that a few times and um, I must admit I uh, don't understand what it means. Okay, this is a reference to something very important that needs to be understood. You have Prajapati, who is also called Prajapita. Prajapita, um, in Brahma Kumaris, we use this word Prajapita Brahma, for the, which is the title given by God to the man who was the chariot that he used to communicate his information. Prajapita means the father of all the people. And also Pati, the word Pati also refers to, you know, Pandav Pati, the father of the Pandavs, which is Pandu, you know. Um, the word Praja means people. So um, Prajapita, the father of the people, refers to the mythological character in the Bible, Quran, and Torah, Adam, the first man. Now, sacrifice, if you look at the Sanskrit, you'll find the word yagya. And yagya isn't um, sacrifice, but a sacrificial ritual, which is slightly different. Uh, in uh, Brahma Kumaris, we talk about Rajaswaha, Avinashi, Gita, Gyan, or Rudra, Gyan, Yagya. And that's a lot of um, adjectives. <laughs> no, it's not. A lot noun. <laughs> th th that's 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 a lot of nouns. 
<laughs> it's a lot of words, <laughs> but a lot of it words. has a lot of significance, and it really uh, comes up right here in the Gita. So what we feel that we are doing is this sacrificial fire in which the horse is sacrificed. The horse means the vehicle of the soul, the horse, the body. Sacrificed means it is made sacred, that means it's purified. Uh, in order, through the knowledge of the Gita, given by Rudra. Rudra is another name of Shiva, you see, which is the meaning of uh, the, the Supreme Being, you see. Um, and the result of that sacrificing, that making sacred of the human life, is a kingdom. And so there is this whole question of God creating a kingdom and dharma, right? Dharma and a kingdom. So you find this in other cultures too. Um, for example, if you go to England, there is this concept uh, written into the Magna Carta of the divine right of kings which is a concept that a person is made into a king by God. How does God make a person into a king? Well, the Gita talks about it. If you want to be a king, then you have to be able to handle power because you have to wield power. And if you yourself are weak, how can you handle power? So the first requirement for a king is you have to have complete mastery over yourself. You have to be the master. What you have to have mastery over is your mind and your sense organs and your perception. So that means you have to really be tutored by God, you see. And then you're competent to take care of a kingdom because a king is the um, servant of the kingdom. He has duties. The king has to protect the kingdom and the king has to nurture the kingdom. He has to make sure, he's sometimes called the provider of food. He has to make sure that all the people in the kingdom have enough food, shelter and everything that they need. This is the meaning of king. If you are a tyrant, or a dictator, you will feed off of the kingdom like a predator. That's not a king, you see. That's a monster. God doesn't create those. There are people who are motivated by lust for power and, and they uh, become tyrants. And that is something that the world has seen and continues to see from time to time and has a hard time dealing with, a very hard time. But here, there has to be a sacrifice of personal desire, a sacrifice of wanting something for the self. Because if you're a king, you're a public servant. Mm. And so there is a duty. It's all about duty. So the word dharma also can be translated as duty. So you want to serve the kingdom as the king then you have to be competent, absolutely competent. In order to be fully competent, you have to be pure. And the ritual sacrifice is a ritual purification. And so the um, expression sacrifice here refers to all the activities and practices and so on of yoga that are about purifying a person's intention, a person's body, a person's mind, a person's motives. Everything has to be pure, otherwise they don't qualify. Yes, so Denise, um, once the subject of sacrifice was dealt with, um, it is once again mentioned that um, one has to perform action whilst unattached. That comes up again. Mm. How is sacrifice related to this? Again, you have this word yagya, which is not sacrifice, but a sacrificial ritual. Okay. And so uh, the yagya is a ritual 
that is performed that involves um, a large amount of money, uh, food, Brahmins, mantras, etc. And it is performed uh, in order to avert a major disaster. Mm. So um, if a person wishes to serve the Yajna, then they must do the action required by that big ritual in order for that ritual to be successful. You see, so that you're not making some personal sacrifice, you're serving the ritual of the sacrificial fire. And that doesn't come through so clearly in the translation, because maybe he wouldn't know about this uh, horse sacrifice that is uh, referred to in the Ramayan. You see, the, the Gita is set in the Mahabharata, but there's many, many references to the Ramayana. So the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are two big epics that refer to the circumstances in which God destroyed evil and brought about the rule of righteousness. And the Gita is the uh, book in which God actually gives his details of what is involved in being righteous. And so naturally there's a reference to the sacrificial fire, but it's not the same as somebody sacrificing something for somebody. It's, it's on a much more broader level. Mr. Denise, um, verse 11 is a verse that I didn't understand. It reads, by this, the sacrifice, may you nourish the gods lowercase g, plural. Yes. Okay. And may the gods nourish you. Mm -hmm. uh, by nourishing each other, you shall attain the highest welfare. And it goes on to say that um, he who enjoys these gifts while not offering them in return is a thief. Yes. So what does this mean? Okay. This refers to the, uh, a lot of the beliefs and rituals of uh, traditional Hindu bhakti. You see, uh, in the, um, you can say, pre-Christian cultures, uh, and, and yet it's, it's even there in the Abrahamic um, scriptures, that you have to prepare a table for God, and you have to sacrifice on that table. So you have the example of uh, food, you see. So food, has to be, according to the rituals, food has to be offered. And who are the gods? They're the ancestors. So they have small lowercase g. They're the ancestors. And the people who are facing global catastrophe are at a particular end of history. The ancestors are at the other end of history. So you, you have this long time cycle of history in which various things happened that eventually uh, culminated in global war out of which there was total annihilation or almost total annihilation, extinction of humanity. So these uh, ancestors are the people who were initially taught by God. And then here is God coming again to teach the descendants of those ancestors. Now, when you factor in the possibility of reincarnation, those ancestors may be remembering their former selves. And again, the ancestor souls are the ones who come and receive the knowledge of God and they have to perform the ritual sacrifice of giving up any kind of desire for personal uh, reward so that what they're doing is a great something for the greater good you see which of course will be rewarded according to the laws of karma but they're not doing it for that purpose you see mm -hmm. and so this reference is in the context of the existing system of rituals in the temples and so on of, uh, of uh, traditional Hinduism. Uh, what does it mean when it says at verse 13, the good who eat the remainder of the sacrifice are released from all evils? Uh, how is this possible? 
Well, this is the thing. Um, food which is offered to God in meditation is purified food. And it is believed that if you eat that food, the, what's called the remains of the sacrifice, that means you sacrifice to God, obviously God doesn't eat it. Mm. The gods don't eat it. It's all, it's all there. Mm. But it's still called the remains. It's distributed among the people. So the, the uh, Brahmins who perform the rituals, they will eat from that, and whoever is participating, they will eat from that. But they're eating sacred food. So for example, if you see in, um, in Christianity, where they will eat the host, and the, it will be said to them, this is the body of Christ, you know, eat this, and they call that Holy Communion, you know, so that food which has been sanctified changes your mind, changes your heart, you see. So this is why it says it rids you of evil. Mm. And so this is a belief that is there in all of the um, uh, exoteric religious practices wherever there is offering to gods or offering to God or offering to the Prophet. Sister Denise, the reader is introduced to Brahman at verse 15, mm -hmm. in verse 15, and it reads, No, the ritual action originates in Brahman, in brackets the Vedas, the, and Brahman arises from the imperishable, therefore the all-pervading Brahman is eternally established in sacrifice. I note that this word appears three times, three times in verse 15, and a capital B is used. How would you define Brahman? Uh, in this chapter, in this verse, uh, which is of course making a lot of reference to the Vedas and Vedic rituals, and a lot of the Vedas describe in detail exactly how you should um, perform the rituals. And this is basically coming from the strand of Hinduism that considers that God is omnipresent. And so Brahman, having a capital B, refers to that omnipresent energy that they have um, uh, uh, perceived and called it God. They say that is God, it's also the energy of nature, it's the... And so basically the idea of that philosophical school is to say that uh, uh, God is... Uh, Immanent and transcendent, which is the idea that um, was also absorbed into Christianity. This idea of God as immanent and transcendent starts right here. Mm. And it came into Hindu philosophy through the sayings of some of the sages who would describe what they experience in their meditations and, and their. Um, understanding of what what that means, you see. Mm. And in uh, Brahma Kumaris, we would say that this experience of the all-pervading energy uh, does not mean that God is everyone and everything and everywhere. Uh, rather, we would say that God is someone, not a human, the energy of God will definitely reach to all places and can be perceived from any place. But um, it doesn't mean that the being of God is in all of those places. Rather like, you know, the sun is somewhere in the sky, but the light and heat from the sun is experienced all over. Sister Denise, I note with interest that uh, God chooses chapter 3 to not just educate Arjuna and uh, us as to what action is as far as human beings are concerned, but he also reveals aspects of his own um, functioning, which is contained in verses 22, 23 and 24. I want to read all three so that you can tell us what it means to you. For me, O oh Arjuna, there is nothing whatever to be done in the three worlds. I'd like you to tell us what three worlds he's referring to. Nor is there anything not attained to be attained. Nevertheless, I engage in action. 
Indeed, if I, unwearied, should not engage in action at all, mankind would follow my path everywhere, O Arjuna. If I did not perform action, these worlds would perish and I would be the cause of confusion. I would destroy these creatures. So, um, on, on one hand, my sense is that uh, God is uh, saying to Arjuna, who is still reluctant to engage in the war, I act, even I act. So, I am not telling you to do something that I am not doing. Exactly. But uh, there is more than one level of understanding of that, is there? L tell us the rest. You know, a God, incorporeal God is in... in um, Latin you have this phrase Deus ex machina mm. the machine of the human world with all of the laws of karma where your last effect is your first cause is like this now some will say in the case of the law of karma being that way there's no need for God uh, others will say in the, the theistic religions that God spoke. Now, speaking is an action. Um, but when you speak, you're not fighting. You see, so you're not, he's not engaged in karma fighting the war. He's simply um, holding the horses for Arjuna's chariot, but he's speaking. So speaking is karma. Arjun has to fight, that's karma. Um, God is called akarta abhogta asojta, which means he doesn't do anything, he doesn't think anything, and nothing ever happens to him. However, movement of the world through the cycle of time is to go from a subtle pradhan stage, the most elevated, complete, uh, perfected stage of being fully energized, and then gradually it declines until you get this state where everything is about to be destroyed. And that is the time when God comes and gives the knowledge which enables the selected or elected or self-chosen people to commune with God and take his energy into themselves without which everything would be destroyed catastrophically and permanently. But that is the thing that enables the renewal of the human world to occur. And this is what he's explaining, but it's quite difficult for people to figure that out. Hmm. And so the Raj Yoga that we study in Brahma Kumaris, that is spelled out in, uh, to that extent, which is the, why, the reason why we can understand it that way. Is it Denise, verse 21, um, reads as follows, whatever the greatest man does, thus do the rest, whatever standard he sets, the world follows that. This is Arjuna that God is referring to as the greatest man, mm -hmm. is he not? Yes. What is the significance of setting a precedent? In any kind of instruction, you have somebody who tells you what to do and somebody who shows you how to do it. And so Arjuna is the person who is being taught by God and then he has to demonstrate that in his action. Mm -hmm. In uh, the Raj Yoga that we do in Brahma Kumaris, Shiv Baba is understood as the supreme incorporeal God who comes into the chariot, the body of Brahma, and gives him the instructions along with everybody else, but then his life is the demonstration, the interpretation of the teachings. So do like this. This is known as Brahmacharya. So Brahmacharya has the meaning of celibacy, which is one aspect, but otherwise Brahmacharya means that you follow the steps of Brahma. And Brahma is known as the creator of the world. So we would know Brahma as the instrument of creation rather than the creator himself. Creator is God. Every step that is taken by Brahma is a um, example that in this situation, this is how you can act. In that situation, this is how you can act. So what we have for ourselves is we have Brahma 
who performed the, his interpretation of the teachings of the Gita as given by Shiva, the incorporeal, and then you also have the same teachings so that you can also decide on your interpretation yourself. Uh, so that you have both. You have the teacher, Shiva, and you have Brahma, the demonstrator, which is also a teacher because very often Brahma is referred to as a teacher. Mm. Acharya means teacher also. As a Denise, I'd just like to pose one last question p to you before we come to the end of uh, today's episode. Verse 25 reads, While those who are unwise act from attachment to action, O Arjuna, so the wise should act without attachment, intending to maintain the welfare of the world. I've already asked you the question about um, unattached action because it comes up in more than one uh, stanza and more than one verse throughout chapter 3. My question to you is, most of us think that if I act, my actions affect me alone. And this is how most people understand or rather misunderstand the law of karma. What effect does my behavior have on um, somebody living in a different country or different continent? How does it impact? How are we connected? You know, one time um, when I had started doing Raj Yoga, I'd been doing it for maybe a few years. And my mother said to me, you know, because you're doing this practice, our whole family is okay. I thought that was a very interesting insight that, that she could so connect. Sweet. Yes, very sweet, but very insightful. That one person in a family is so connected with the family that whatever they do is going to affect what happens to and the thinking of and feeling of the whole rest of the family. Y you, you hear this idea in a number of different contexts where what one person does impacts what is happening to other people in other side of the world. There is this idea of six degrees of separation and since Facebook it's now four degrees of separation that everyone is connected to everyone else by at least four separations of people. Here we are talking about this, somebody is going to be watching it, somebody is going to be interpreting it in their way and using it in whatever way they decide. And so definitely, um, you know, some people influence large numbers of people. Everybody influences someone. Mm. And it, you can be a bad influence, mm. or you can be a good influence. So thank you. We have to bring this episode to an end today, Sister Denise. We have run out of time. So there you go. Uh, do you, as an individual, look at your actions and ask yourself what your motive is behind your actions? Do you look at the karma of what you are doing? And to what extent do you put into practice that which is contained in the Bhagavad Gita on the yoga of action? Sister Denise has shared her views on the um, verses that we've read. And so I invite you to look at your life and ask yourself how this is relevant to you. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you soon. Thank you and goodbye.